Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute. My name is John Lanchowski. I'm president of the Institute. And for those of you who are new here, we uh, are an independent graduate school with five master's programs, a doctoral program, and 17 certificate programs. We have uh, a faculty of scholar practitioners, uh, which distinguishes the character of a lot of what we do. We specialize in teaching the, all of the different arts of statecraft, the different instruments of national power, and how they are and ought to be integrated in a whole of government, integrated national strategic approach. Um, to, to we have, uh, in addition to these academic programs, around 100 uh, extracurricular lectures and symposia here every year. Um, and we're delighted you are attending one of them. Uh, this is a uh, special lecture that is being done in the memory of our late professor, uh, Bob Steffen. Bob uh, uh, was, uh, had an extraordinary career uh, in uh, several different U.S. intelligence agencies, uh, the NSA, uh, the DIA, the the, uh, he worked in the Library of Congress, I even recall, and, and of course he finished up his career at the CIA. He was one of the U.S. governments and the nation's foremost experts on the Soviet intelligence services, and he taught a course here on, uh, on spies and subversion, uh, and uh, uh, he, he brought a uh, a whole new generation of students into consciousness about the methods uh, and the operational traditions of, of those intelligence services. And, uh, and these are lessons, of course, that are completely relevant uh, in today's world, given that some three quarters of the members of the elite in Russia are alumni uh, or active members of those intelligence services. So we're, uh, Bob was the author of, uh, of an extraordinary book called Stalin's Secret War, which is uh, his war, uh, counterintelligence war, during world, against the Nazis in World War II. And one learns extraordinary uh, lessons about the willingness of, the, uh, uh, of Stalin, for example, to sacrifice a hundred thousand troops uh, like pawns on a chessboard uh, in order to deceive Hitler and lure his forces ultimately into the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, there are very few people who were able to do this, to write this kind of scholarship. As you know, uh, during the Cold War, uh, American scholars did not write about several subjects. They didn't write about the Soviet intelligence services, they didn't write about the Soviet military, and they didn't write about Soviet human rights violations. I have a couple of shelves of books about the KGB up in my office, and virtually none of them are written by American scholars from universities. They're usually written by intelligence alumni, journalists, and defectors. Uh, but those are, and today the same, the same lesson holds when it comes to dealing with China. Uh, I call it the four taboos that scholars and journalists don't write about. It's just Chinese military buildup, uh, their human rights violations, their uh, intelligence operations, and their overt and covert influence operations. So uh, Bob was one of those PhDs who uh, uh, had the courage to go against what was politically correct in the academic world to actually write about these things. Well, in, in honor of him, we are very pleased to welcome uh, one of our own professors, uh, Dr. Marek Hodakiewicz. Uh, Dr. Hodakiewicz, in my book, is one of the most productive scholars in the Western world about matters of East Central Europe and, and Russia. He teaches our courses here um, on, on Russia, on modern political dip, uh, and political diplomatic history, uh, on uh, geography and strategy, uh, on um, mass murder prevention in, failing and uh, in failed and failing states, 
uh, he has an immense breadth and uh, does, uh, of, 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 of historical and intellectual interests and has also done uh, uh, courses on Western civilization and its intellectual tradition on the history of the Ottoman Empire. He speaks a lot of Japanese too and you could probably get him to teach you a course on the history of Japan. He, 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 he occupies here the Kościuszko chair in Polish studies and uh, he is the author of the most recent, recent book, Intermarium, which means between the seas. And it happens to be the conceptual origin of the so-called Three Seas Initiative, which is the diplomatic initiative recent, recently launched by the President of Poland and the President of Croatia, which bring together something like uh, uh, ten countries or so uh, in Eastern and Central Europe that, that are bounded by the three seas, the Baltic, the Black, and the Adriatic Seas, in order to integrate them, partly for defense reasons, for energy cooperation, uh, other cooperation in electrical grid, in educational and cultural ties, to largely to strengthen the eastern flank of NATO. Uh, so we're delighted to, to, I'm delighted to turn this over to Marek, who will talk about the criminal above ground uh, cultural background of today's Russian political culture. Marek, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for reflective music for Ball. This here is for Professor Stepan. He was no academic, he was with the CIA. That means. Uh, it, he was interesting. He was open-minded. He didn't need safe space. We made our jokes all the time about a variety of things, and we talked about esoteric topics, not about lesbians in convents in Venice, unless they were counterintelligence officers. Uh, in medieval times for the KGB, no, we talked about Austria, Hungary's counterintelligence in World War One, Bob was working on trying to translate a book to teach a, a foreign counterintelligence culture to our students, to America. He was also a student of um, uh, one of our geniuses, Jack Ziak. He wrote the dissertation under Jack Ziak with the assistance of another of our professors, uh, Dave Thomas. They are great mentors and great brains. No topic was off limit, and Bob was very flexible on time. He wrote to me, how can you explain the Holocaust, he says. It, I wouldn't be surprised if it had happened in Russia. That would be just in tune with the history about Germany. He was such a sophisticated culture at one point. So I responded, well, it's very simple, it's called Satan. Satan works in mysterious ways. And the duty of intelligence and counterintelligence officers is to believe in evil and to thwart it. So Bob was always a fabulous a conversation partner, and I learned a lot from him. I'm sorry he's gone. <coughs> okay. With this in mind, I'll start with, with two anecdotes. I go to Russia from time to time to research every single time, including in the archives. So about 15 years ago or so, I was in Moscow with another guy, and the other guy became, behaved like a proper Soviet. He was rude, crude, and unpleasant to everybody. Me? Well, Western civilization in general, and uh, feudalism in particular, requires elegance and class. So I was myself. No matter who it was I encountered, I was myself. I didn't fake anything. I made my jokes. I tried to be polite. So guess what? We go to the Lenin Library. 
the guy was himself, they sent him packing. They said, oh, you have to have a picture, and you can take a picture five blocks down. And then we have to process your application. It took him three days to get in. I didn't come with him. I came an hour later, because I slept in, of course. And I said, hello. They said, oh, we'll take your picture. We'll nominate your ID. You can go in. So it works. It should be polite. On the other hand, my colleague believed that if he if he behaved the standard way, he said this is a urki, vori, you know. The criminals behave and that's what Russia is. He tried the same thing at Garf. That's the Gosudar Stieni Archiv. Didn't work out too well. Me, I was myself, and I kid you not, one of the supervisors after about two hours. He came up to me and said, I copied some documents for you that are not in the catalog regarding the de deportation of the Poles to Siberia. <coughs> for nothing. Just be yourself. Go against the grain. You shouldn't care who rules. If those people are incompatible with you, uh, it's too bad for them. Good and evil don't change, including manners. It pays to be polite, even if you're told that the culture is permeated with something else. Okay, so that's one anecdote. Another anecdote. This was maybe 10 years ago. We decided to hike the Gorgana Mountains, go into, deeper into the Carpathians, to see if we could enter Moldova unofficially. And yes, indeed one can. It's just a 50 kilometer hike. We got off a train at I think 3 in the morning in the middle of nowhere, but we found a cab in a, at a little train station. And the cabbie was going to take us as high up as his car would go. So we were driving towards the mountains, dawn set, it was very beautiful. I began to notice very decent houses, including California style mansions. So I turned to the cabbie and I said, What is Zakonia? Wise guys, make thieves? And the cabbie smiled and said, No, no, they are legalized. Some of them are deputies in the parliament. Okay, I don't know if I'll operate this properly. Here are some definitions. The title of my presentation is Suki Zakoni, a criminal key to Putin's Russia. Vori Zakoni are made thieves. Suki are formerly made thieves who betrayed the code of the thief. So they are bitches. I'm sorry, this is the only time I'll translate Suki. Suki Zakon. What makes one a Suka? That's very easy. Any form of cooperation with the human world, in particular the government, that's what makes you a Suka Zakon. You're no longer war Zakon, or legal, or thief in law. You are now a fallen agent, angel in their universe. Their universe is called Vorskimir. Vorskimir is a complete opposite to Freyerskimir. That means the world of the suckers. You guys are suckers. I'm the wise guy. You are suckers. Your rules, I don't care about. Your government, I. Don't pay attention to. You're suckers. I'm going to take advantage of that's what why God, if I believe in God, put you on this earth. You're suckers. I am a man. Sometimes Voy refer to themselves as human beings. So everybody else is not a human being by definition. Losing. 
the criminal leadership, the voters that call me, the top people, imagine themselves to be as a total negation of the aristocratic elite of Russia, of the Russian Empire. That is, manners are for suckers. Honesty, for suckers. Etc., etc. Now, when I say the aristocratic elite, I don't mean only the aristos, titled people, but also the middle classes, entrepreneurs, etc. Anybody who acquired over the 19th century into the, 20, into the 20th century any kind of veneer of uh, what the Russians called kultura, kulturny narod, culture. That was for suckers. Anybody from any ethnic group had to be a sucker. Rank and file criminals imagined themselves and were perceived by others as a complete juxtaposition of ordinary Russians and other denizens of the Russian Empire, then Soviet Union, and now the Russian Federation. They are a breed apart. This must be understood. They are the parasite which subsists on everyone else. Here is the old Russian hierarchy. We've assembled a few pictures. Here is Bolshevik propaganda. You have the uh, aristocrats, priests, and bishops, bourgeoisie, and then the working classes. And here, here you have a few pictures. Alexander, Tsar Alexander's family, the giant Alexander's family. And you have the court, and the court ball. That is indeed how they appeared. And they were the first in Russia to develop some kind of parallel reflexes that could be recognized in Europe as not Moscovite Mongol, but indeed influenced by the West. And that did not happen until uh, Sophia von Anhalt Zerbst became Empress Catherine the Great. Peter <coughs> was interested in reforms indeed, but military reforms, so if he liked English ships and German cannon, he took it along with the technology and specialists, but he modeled his bureaucracy on a model called Qin, as in Qin dynasties, hence Chinovniki bureaucrats in Russia. So he was an eclectic guy, interested in, in strengthening the state, not westernizing it. Catherine brought a veneer of culture to the court. Eventually it trickled down, and by the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, there was something of an intelligentsia in Russia. People who understood, read, and were familiar with Western culture. But the greatest number were not kulturni at all. They were not the cultured ones. They were the commoners, common people. And here you have urban working classes as depicted by Miasoyerov and uh, a picture of kids, child labor. I don't know, they must be 13, 14 years old. The bulk of the population, however, was this. Peasants. 90% by the turn of the century were peasants. They were freshly liberated, which happened in 1863. So you have examples, barge haulers, on the Volga, it's just feudal serfs.
out of the people it was that the criminal world emerged, not out of the elites. Here is one of my favorite. She was called um, uh, Sonia Golden Hand. She was one of the most prolific pickpockets who graduated into bank robbing as well as home invasions, etc. She was born and grew up in Povonsky, which is a suburb of Warsaw. Now, the criminal world was perhaps the least prejudiced of all universes of the Russian Empire. Therefore, you frequently have Yiddish words, borrowings in the criminal world, like Melina, <coughs> safe house, or uh, Friar, indeed, <laughs> which is sucker. Uh, she married several times <coughs> and uh, dazzled everybody first with her beauty and then with her skills as a thief. So you also had the word of the Stecker. A thief's den, oftentimes, especially in the pale of settlement, could be the Jewish tavern. It was, by the way, called Yama or a little hole in the ground, then you have a number of uh, a prisoners here. These are actual photographs of, of a St. Petersburg high-class prostitutes, <coughs> women, convicts, street kids. This, would, this, this particular milieu would uh, bloom under communism in particular in the wake of World War I and the Civil War. Uh, these were just the lower depths, plying a variety of trades, sometimes with very interesting subdivisions and skills, and with some kind of a controlling hierarchy. Uh, oftentimes, they weren't just fallen men and women who to survive, ply their trade, oftentimes those were entire dynasties of people continuing what their parents had done. You would meet children of prostitutes. Females would usually become prostitutes. Males would steal or do something else. That was the nature of the system, the Russian imperial autocratic system, that the criminal underground, the margin was wide, and they had no adequate mechanisms to offer an alternative. In the countryside, one of the most favorite, one of the most favorite pursuits was stealing horses. We have a horse market, uh, and then Maria found a couple of funny photographs, uh, including <laughs> Vladimir Putin. I, I'm not alleging that he stole the horse of this. I think she was trying to make a point. I'll tell you an anecdote. This is from a friend's grandfather's, you know, friend's wife's grandfather's memoirs in the Grodno Gubernia. He was a middle-ranking landed noble with an estate and uh, a, a couple of wise guys came. One was a Ruthenian Orthodox and the other one was Jewish. And they said, you know, there are thieves around here. They covet your horses, but we can protect them. <laughs> so, it wasn't always that you had to steal, you could protect. And if you took the deal, then there wouldn't be anybody interloping on your estate. Otherwise, you'd have to defend yourself. Horses were very easy to move in the countryside. And uh, you could rebrand them or change the brand, cover it, 
and sell them down the river. There were, of course, poachers, timber thieves, and others. Please kindly pay attention to the top, to the branding on the face. Until 1846, it was customary to brand your face with Vor, you're a thief, before you got sent to Siberia. Then the Tsarist Ukas changed it, and uh, you were branded Katorznik, or forced laborer, slave laborer. From the middle of the 19th century, or in early second half of the 19th century, there was a very interesting development, namely the political and criminal underworlds began to mingle in prison. Well, that is not to say that my ancestors were not sent to Siberia, uh, uh, taken in war with the Moscovites, oh, they were, usually separately, and they could be ransomed as prisoners of war. In the 19th century, it was customary to mingle people. There were certain privileges, uh, with certain exceptions. That is, if you were nobility, you wouldn't be flogged, unless your nobility was stripped from you. If you were nobility, uh, sometimes you could even enjoy the privilege of uh, 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 taking your family with you. Lenin did that, for instance. If you were nobility, you didn't have to be necessarily chained. But again, there were exceptions. Major Lukashevich, who was arrested in the 1820s for a conspiracy in Warsaw, was still alive in the 1870s, I think, all the time in chains. They put him in the Schlieselburg fortress. But usually, whether or not you were compelled to wear chains, uh, you traveled increasingly with not only your political prisoners, but also common <coughs> criminals, including <coughs> the Vorskimir. Now, the Vorskimir, Vor thieves, refused to collaborate in any shape and form, so they may have considered the rest, especially politicals, as suckers who would stand up for anybody's rights. Are you a sucker? Take advantage of them. You're smart. But sometimes they would look with admirations at educated people. Why? Because educated people could read them things, write them letters, tell them stories, and if they were doctors, that was very helpful. So, in the Chaim Catechism, we read, we will unite ourselves with the virile criminal world, the true and only revolutionary of Russia. Why? Because the criminal underworld has an explosive anarchical potential. Most revolutionaries in Russia were students. Some of them trust fund kids. Do you think mom taught Lenin how to forge? Or steal? No. They were trust fund kids. They had to learn some. Hence also the attraction of the criminal world. Stalin organized one of the greatest heists since they couldn't breach the safes in the bank they figured it's better to attack the money as it was transported. So Stalin and his friends started throwing bombs. A couple score of people died by totally innocent bystanders. There was a shootout. The revolutionaries didn't care. And the criminals who were with them didn't care either. Unfortunately, they were out of luck. They, the, the howl was huge. The score was multi-million but all in 500 banknote, banknotes, 500 rubles. The bank had all the numbers. 
when Lenin and his friends tried to peddle it in Western Europe, the people who actually handled the cash got busted. Yes, but hey, this is for the revolution. It's not like they killed people or were stealing anything. Yeah, it's all for progress. Yes. By the 19th and beginning of the 20th uh, century, you had another world, both in and out of jail, in and out of exile, in and out of katorga, forced labor, that mingled criminals and political prisoners. So here is an example. This is farewell to Europe, Polish insurgents in chains crossing themselves and moving into Siberia. This was a post dividing Europe from Asia. And on the left, you have Vera Finger, a leader of the terrorist organization People's Will, Narodnaya Volya. On the right hand side, you have Jurgis Bielinis. He smuggled books from Königsberg into the Russian Empire, Lithuanian language books. He was as criminally guilty as everybody else. So you see that universe was ambivalent. Almost everybody I know, in my family and friends, wears it as a badge of honor to have been to Siberia or have had families in jail in Siberia. And oftentimes they also include stories about pretty screwed up criminals they encountered. Uh, All sorts of people went. We had a little picture of the pickpocket people. Here is one of the most famous Odessa uh, gangsters. A bank robber, wise guy, criminal. His nickname was Mikey the Jap. That was his nickname, Misha Yaponchi. Just an extremely colorful character who eventually joined the Bolsheviks. He raised a regiment composed partly of his vore, thieves, and partly of students. Except the Bolsheviks began after a while to demand discipline. And Mishka didn't like it. So the communists shot him. You see one doesn't always flawlessly join a revolution, especially past its anarchical stage. People who don't conform are considered a liability and they are shot. That is Odessa. And here are the so-called Bivshi Eludzi former people, Lishiansi. They're my people. Here is Mesheremietiev, Golitsyn, Saburov, Trubetskoy. The cultured people, the elegant people, the face of Russia I want to remember. The face of Russia I know. The face of Russia that does not exist in Russia. It has survived in exile. The communists created a special category for them, Bivshi that means former people, they are no longer human beings. And murdered most of them. Those who didn't escape died. The world was turned upside down because these people disappeared, died, or into the bowels of the gula, and they were replaced with people like this. So some of the friends of Mishka Japonczyk liked the Bolsheviks all the way. They joined the Cheka. They enjoyed torturing people. Some of them were sick, really. Sadists. Why not? And now they had a sanction of law. 
law behind them. Here you have the new revolutionary elites led by a Polish Catholic apostate and a nobleman. Uh, his family was from outside of Novogrudek. They were friends of uh, my family. They thought he, his family thought that Felix was a psychopath. A psychopath. And that's what he was. Remember, it was a self-selected group of psychopaths. My white Russians, Galia, always tell me that the revolution was staged by Poles, Jews, Hungarians, and Latvians. I said, hey, there were also Chinese guards at the Kremlin at the beginning. Why? Well, because nobody trusted Russians. <laughs> Plus, foreigners in the Russian Empire, Jews, Poles, etc., had beef against the Tsar. In the Russian vernacular, pre-revolutionary vernacular, the words student, Pole, and Jew were synonymous with revolutionary. Student, Pole, and Jew. When Tsar Alexander the second survived one of many assassination attempts, he came up to his would-be assassin and asked, Volevo Polonaise. Are you Polish? He was a, an ethnic Russian, but it didn't matter. An ethnic Pole got him. His name was Alexander Hryniewiecki. They were petty nobility working for Prince Radziliu in forestry in Jesiewierz. Yes, Poles, Jews, and students. That's actually, uh, that stereotype reflects the revolutionary underground. Well, the Armenians shouldn't smile, they were there too. Shame on you, anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, I call this the Watchmen. This is a crew, an NKVD crew, from, uh, uh, from the Soviet uh, Ukrainian Socialist Republic. The watchmen. They didn't steal the watches. Those were bonuses for shooting people. This, these are killers, maybe, I don't know, 30,000 people at this point. And they like to show it off. And Maria wanted you to smile, so she included this picture too. It's an old Soviet tradition. This is the capture of Berlin. You see one of the officers climbing with two watches. My father remembers when the Soviets came to Vilno in 1944. He was eight years old, seven years old. And the political commissar, who along with a colonel were billeted up on my great-grandfather's place, had a um, little gas mask pouch filled with watches, which he would every night put on the pillow, wind up, check him out, put him back, in the pouch and tied the pouch around his head to sleep so nobody would steal. So we call that penchant for watches, watchmen, which is also a sign of the criminal underworld. Right now they show off with better watches. Uh, the Gulag was conceptualized in the 1920s it developed into the 1930s, and once again, the criminals and the political prisoners found themselves under one roof when there was a roof. The criminals, Vorik Zakonia, made thieves, faced a cruel dilemma or I should say, devil's bargain, a Faustian bargain. They were offered by the guards and prison authorities to become prison and camp trustees. Sort of like the Nazis had couple prison and trustees. Collaborate with us, you'll get more food. You'll also get privileges. Most of the made thieves, Boris Zakonia said, to hell with you commies, and they began to fight. 
for from the very beginning there was a number of thieves who wanted to take advantage of this situation because the communists allowed them to terrorize the political prisoners which was not the case under the Tsar and here you have plugging the throat a common punishment for any camp inmate deemed to have insulted the Vori or who was accused of snitching this is plugging the throat you took a rod and plug the throat. And here is a war in the Gulag. You can see that some of the people sport tattoos. It is a war between the Vori and the Suki. The bitches, those Vori who took the devil's bargain. But there are other people involved too. And there is a great deal of an overlap. Former military men whom Stalin sent to the Gulag in the 1940s, including after 1945. The Vori considered it a lethal offense if one of them volunteered to fight the Germans. Remember, Vorsky Mir was apart from the Freyerski Mir. So some of the Vori didn't want to snitch and work for the prison administration, they just said, Eh, maybe there will be better food, and also we don't like the Germans, and also we'll get women. Woohoo! So they volunteered to get out of the gulag. This was considered a lethal offense by the Vorsky Mir. Eventually, many of those former Vori made it back together with military men. Alliances were formed. The alliances were fluid because it all depended on the situation, the camp, and other factors. They fought. And guess what? Suki, the Suki won, not the Vori. So those who said it was all right to collaborate with the government, with the communist government, came up on top. Also because they had, obviously, permission of the onlookers on the watchtower. The authorities. And I am sorry to report that I had to censor the pictures at the request of the Lord and Master. These are the least pornographic things we could find to show it to you. I have an encyclopedia, three volume encyclopedia of these. Uh, the cross means a made thief. He's crucified himself. Now, in the Soviet Union and then in Russia, you couldn't really have fake tattoos like here in the United States. If they caught you with fake tattoos, that is tattoos you didn't deserve, they take it off of you. If you were lucky, it was just hot irons. If not, they use a blade and strip it off of you before killing you, not after. Yeah. These are very important signs. So one time I was on a plane heading home to the US, and there was a guy in a wife beater with himself crucified on his back. He had a uh, the moon and stars tattooed here, which made him a night thieves, and he had tears. Tears means he whacked people. I said, who gave him, who gave him a visa? <laughs> right now, the United States military, all branches, requires their recruits to take their clothes off before signing them up. I think the agencies have databases, I'm sure the FBI does, the CIA neither confirms nor denies it has a database, which means it does. I don't know about the State Department, and I don't know whether our consular officers realize what they are looking at when they deal with people in the post-Soviet zone. I doubt it. So, when those people got out of the Gulag, 
and jails after 1953, 1956, they facilitated the Soviet black market. And they facilitated it because they bribed the militia. They started working with militia, thus breaking the thieves' code. They broke the code. They were no longer Varif Zakonian. They were the Suki Zakonian. The Suki who won the war in the Gulag introduced a new paradigm of a criminal in Russia. Criminal who works with the nomenclatura and the police. Say you corrupt a factory director and the first secretary of the Communist Party, and you uh, acquire illegally from them rubber shoes. You take them from Vladivostok to Moscow and make money. And you pay the nominal price plus bribes to cover the expenses, but you that your, your overhead is hardly anything because you, you used state transport. And it wasn't just the Voriv Zakonya, the thieves, who would say in Russia, oh, if it belongs to the states, to the state, it means it belongs to nobody. If it belongs to nobody, it's ours, so we steal. Completely corrupting. A practice of this for over 70 years left an imprint that makes the former people who are emigres not recognize the Russians, contemporary Russians, as anything of their own. They are freaked out. This is actually a translation of uh, a Soviet criminal police uh, uh, sheet to identify the perpetrators. Uh, for, all it, for all it was worth, it's really easy to label, say, oh, this is Russian Mafia. How do you know they are Russians? The Mafia doesn't have to be ethnicity, it's usually clans and families who happen to be of an ethnicity but not necessarily Russian. There are regional divisions even among the Russians. And of course, the way of the Suki was practiced all the way to the top leadership. This is Edward Shevardnadze. I have this story from one of our professors who revealed it because Secretary of State George Shultz was going to meet for the first time with his Soviet counterpart. And a friend of mine told his supervisor, oh, and the supervisor said, do you know anything about this? About this guy? Yes, I do. He there was an altercation between the KGB and the militia, each supporting different mafia groups in Georgia. Shevardnadze was the head of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, MVD. And he and his boys lured the competition to this TBDC electric locomotive building. And they dropped a train engine on nine of the computing mafiosi, Shabarnadze himself, smashing them to bits. Do you think the Secretary of State of the United States should have been informed about this? Yes, but you are normal. The State Department was the tantest, so obviously nobody wanted the news to get out, and the supervisor, supervisor told my friend, quiet, this doesn't get out of here. So my friend went to lunch and he knew that about the same time that Cavernous Soviet style cafeteria at the State Department, another friend of his would be lunching, who happened to be the personal assistant to the Secretary of State. And the personal assistant said, Hey, do you know anything about you? You know we're meeting him? Do you know anything about him? 
No, no, I no. Well, to come on, tell me. So he did inform his friend about this train engine dropping exercise. And the friend said, this is fantastic. Can you write us a memo? No, no, I can't. No, why? Oh, unless the Secretary of State requests it at a certain level. So the request came. My friend's boss was furious. And my friend typed it up. The Secretary of State received it. He suppressed it promptly. However, if a request is made in a certain bureaucratic form, then it's immediately cc'd to National Security Council, the President, the Pentagon, CIA, FBI, and NATO. That means everybody knew. Everybody knew. You have to know how to work the bounds of the beast. Federal bureaucracy. Then you can even tell a story like this. Criminal leadership. And as I said, you don't have to be Russian Mafia to be Tsukov Zakon. Or there are still, there are still a few Vorev Zakoni who are not mainstream. This is one of the most famous ones. Aslan Usoyan. You think he was Russian? Do you know who he was? Yezidi Kurd from Georgia. Clans. 11 assassination attempts. How? Finally, he was bumped off probably by a sniper, probably because he tried to remedy a fratricidal problem within the underworld. Yevsey Agron, you should know him. The state of New Jersey lost $1 billion in revenue a year because of this guy. Because he came to America and he said, they're all suckers. One of his capers was selling heating uh, oil for fuel. <laughs> yes, you see a grow. And he terrorized Brighton Beach. But those people, sometimes they would, I couldn't get a picture, but I saw them like politicians with labels from George Armani, which they didn't take off. Still on their jackets because they wanted everybody to know it was George Armani. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, first thing they did with Gorbachev's reforms, they took advantage of a variety of loopholes and permeated the nascent controlled market. We call it free market, but whatever possibilities emerge, for instance, to set up cooperatives, they were there. If you wanted to open a store, they'd help you, or they would open the store themselves and hire you to front them, and you would sell normal things, except after a while, you'd also have to sell heroin. <laughs> so it's bread on this shelf, heroin on the other. In the 1990s, oftentimes you couldn't tell any businesses apart, but they no longer call themselves, most of them, Vori. Of course, they will never call themselves Suki. They call themselves businessmen, yeah, businessmen, or Autoriteti. And this is how they legalize themselves. These are again censored because. There are tombstones, these are tombstones of the ones who got bumped off. There's sometimes, and my favorite was actually not just a, a, a sort of a picture, but a monument to a guy in a Mercedes with golden chains and a blonde next to him, and that's a tombstone. They legalized themselves. The funerals were oftentimes a municipal and criminal events. Again, the criminal world 
met the political world now openly. They didn't need to pretend what, like with the black market in the 60s or 70s. They just came out of the closet. No, no division between the church and state. Kozlowski, one of the boys. Kravtsov. If you wanted to do business in Russia, you needed a krisha, a roof, in post-Soviet Russia. What does it mean? Anybody from British Petroleum to a dentist from Sacramento, these are all true stories, had to hire a retired KGB guy. Well, this is what usually would happen. Uh, you hired him, he'd let you develop your business, and then after five years, he'd bump you off. Or come to you, beat you up, and say, surrender your assets, go back to Sacramento. There was a dentist who moved from Sacramento to fix Brezhnevite cheese. And after he developed the business, he was no longer needed. Krisha. It wasn't just for foreigners, it was for everybody. Hostile takeovers were the rule. This guy, Hodorkovsky, started his career by taking advantage of Gorbachev's Pierestroika, in particular the law on cooperatives, by setting one up in Moscow at his university. First thing he did, he promised students trips to foreign lands. All you have to do is put a deposit down. And then, of course, the company went bankrupt. So first people he ripped off were students. Second people, a Ponzi scheme, senior citizens. He was the first ever to pioneer a Soviet propaganda technique of branding himself. Before, the only person he ever had on the bus was Lenin. You know, portrait of Lenin. Hodorkovsky put his own picture on the bus and said, trust me, save your money at my savings bank. He marched from one bankruptcy to the, to the next, ripping everybody off, and he always came out enriched until he hit a mother load, acquired for peanuts a major oil company. And then he was untouchable. He just couldn't go bankrupt. And now he is a human rights leader. <laughs> and you have all the kleptocrats. What do they have in common? Virtually all of them are either KGB or snitches of the KGB. Which means they were not, I repeat, at the beginning they were not real. They were used as fronts. And they were handled by their own handlers, case officers. But once you make your first billion dollars, you say, Ooh, this dog controls me. I'm going to hire five dogs. They'll bump him off. Remember the bonanza in the 1990s in Russia? Something like almost a trillion dollars changed hands, hands for eight, nine, mil, nine, nine billion dollars. And that was a slaughter of not so innocents. If you're interested in it, David Satter is the best and most accessible in his description of that kind of chaos. Russia was stolen blind. All in the name of liberalism. There is a description by uh, David Satter, a description of um, uh, his conversation with Yegor Gaidar, a prime minister, who told, basically, David, that you, to have capitalism, you have to steal. And David retorted to the effect that you are a victim of your own communist propaganda when you think that free market is predicated on robbing people. 
Where is your honor? And Gaidar laughed in the American's face. Honor? <laughs> yeah. Meet the crew. Well, the ride had to end sometime. If you thought you were George Soros, but you ended up like Khodorkovsky in the Gulag. If you played, if you kowtow to Putin, like Roman Abramovich, you're fine, you're legalized. You're a legalized suka. And now, essentially, it's a government of sukas. Here's latest developments. Just, I picked, I don't know, a month, maybe six weeks. Armenian ambassador in Berlin was officially accused by the German intelligence, German government, of uh, having ties to mafia, to the mafia. And he said, yeah, so what? His government hasn't recalled him yet, which means uh, Mr. Kalgatsian will not have a job. A, most of the Vori still expected to be cuddled. But when Putin clamped down, he firmly believes in hypocrisy. So yes, you can have privileges in jail. However, if it comes out, we're going to bust you. This guy lived a high life in jail. And I think he wanted to brag. Either he or someone else put it on Facebook or on the equivalent of Facebook or YouTube. Or... Oh, his former wife. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so she stuck it to him. He did. Because he's a privileged one. He bribed the guards and the prison authorities. Anyway, so he is in trouble. His internet no longer functions because Putin got peeved. Uh, here is a so called controversial Uzbek businessman. Just elected the head of Amateur Bo uh, Boxing Federation. Uh, then it turns out that Gaf uh, Gafur Rahimov has ties to his own government. Oh, what am I saying? To mafia, <laughs> which is essentially, as you see, legalized in the post-Soviet zone. It's very hard to tell them apart. Uh, we couldn't fit all the books from my shelves on that, but those of you who are interested should, lead, should read at least a couple of things. Right. Marg Galeotis, the Voy, Russia's Super Mafia is the most exhaustive. Then you have Paul Klyevnikov, Godfather, Godfather of the Kremlin. Now, Paul Klyevnikov thought he was an American, so he was mute. He published this book in Russia. He was the head of Forbes Russia. And on his way to work in Moscow, a drive-by. They killed him. Because he wrote about things that I just told you about. Uh, Ruskaya Mafia, that's pretty good. And this is my infamous uh, encyclopedia of Russian criminal tattoo. This is the most racist, anti-Semitic, sexist, a sexist, a pornographic, and neo-Nazi collection of pictures I've ever seen. They were all assembled by an NKVD officer who made it his hobby to collect tattoos and interpret them. Those of you who are in the business of working in the vineyards should learn, or at least should acquire, the encyclopedia. For your own reference. And I don't know how that's going to work, but probably I'll have
have to get this is just a minute and a half it's a movie it's a film Correct, it should be Sukha, but give him some time. Definitions are important. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I have for you. If you have any questions, shoot. Don't be sad, it's just life. So, how you would foresee the evolution of the position? Uh, my sister calls me Cassandra. I don't, I mean, I appreciate it, but I'm not looking forward to being gang raped and having my to uh, throat slit when Troy falls. So I try uh, not to predict too much. Nothing lasts forever. I thought communism would end, just not in my lifetime. Obviously, Russia is changing some things stay the same. Putin won't live forever. The system is too much grounded in an individual to endure without an ideology. At the same time, Kulturnie Luzi have begun to re-emerge in Russia. Intelligentsia. I just hope they won't get radicalized like they did at the end of the 19th century because that destroyed Russia and gave Russia a revolution. All the liberal and progressive intelligentsia, instead of going at it in an evolutionary way, they wanted everything immediately. Life doesn't work like this. And I know why they were angry with the Tsar. Don't take me wrong. I love my white Russians. I love the Sheremetyevs. But... Um, I wasn't, well, my family was not a great fan of autocracy. I'm not a great fan of Putin. It doesn't mean I want to see 
Russia going down in flames for a variety of reasons, human, geopolitical, etc., etc. So I don't know what they will do. I think anti-corruption drive is good, exposing those guys. The internet is still not Chinese, so regular Russians as well as uh, the Russian opposition has a venue. They ought to hear criticism, so no pussy riot. Uh, they should be prudent in their moves. They don't want to undermine the world again. The more stable it is, without freezing, the more decent people can make a living. Putin halted to an extent the cycle of takeovers. What I mean by this is when Putin came to power, it was not that easy by outside forces to take your company away, a small or medium-sized company away. Not that easy, but it's still easy by the government. Hence uh, the Magnitsky case. Uh, I shed no tears over Browder. Uh, Browder was an enabler of Putin, and he only got where he was and had the opportunities because his grandfather was the first secretary of the Communist Party USA. So everyone should know that. He's a version of Hodorkovsky, except from America. But um, with stability comes the possibility for the Russian intelligentsia to make a more decent li living and to educate themselves so that they could be prepared. I love nobody more in Russia than a guy, Nikita, who is, uh, I've been working with, uh, with him forever, who was um, the deputy head of Memorial. But I remember Nikita Pietrov and his friends, when they were warned, you have to get rid of the KGB in the 1990s. Oh no, we are liberals, we're in power. What, do you want us to have witch hunts? I said, yeah, the witches hunted you for 70 years. Get rid of them or they'll be bad. And until this very day, Nikita and his friends will admit, we never expected Putin. I said, what the heck are you talking about? The only skilled people in Russia. The only group that knew how to operate with power. They knew the dialectics. They had information. They were the only ones not traumatized. Remember that nobody suffered more than the Russian people from communism in terms of the number murdered. Remember them. The liberals didn't want to get rid of them, so they have what they deserve, just like they hated the Tsar and they got Bolsheviks. Well, thank you very much. So Russia has a long way ahead of it. And before you translate anything into a viable political opposition, you have to concentrate on culture. Don't buy Nietzsche again, like Russia did back in the second half of the 19th century. Concentrate on culture, economy, etc. It's a long march. It's a long march to make Russia wholesome. Yes, sir. What is the status of the Russian Orthodox Church, and do they ever make a comment about society? Well, well, I'm happy to report that for the first time since before the revolution, or before the 1920s, the person who is in charge of the Russian Orthodox Church is not an officer of the terror apparatus. He's just a snitch from Estonia. Uh, so. There is no division between the church and state because it's a Byzantine system. Uh, the emperor is also pope. In essence, Putin's in charge. Uh, 
at the grassroots there is a revival but most Russians may identify themselves as cultural orthodox they don't go to church there is a church by Ljubljanka because of a relationship between orthodoxy and the state a, the Ljubljanka FSB and SVR people come to church but they don't know how to behave in church yeah you stand around in the orthodox church but there are times when you you know cross yourself and pray they don't know so in a way at the highest level the church is appropriated for state ceremonies and it's supposed to justify certain things of the authorities. At the lowest level there is some form of hope in my opinion where in some places the priests and the parishioners began organizing local life and as you know everything is local. When um, Obama appointed his ambassador and I was asked to opine on the hearings which were about to happen. My piece of advice was for the ambassador to recognize that in Russia there isn't just one building called the Kremlin in Moscow, that there were cities like Nizhny Novgorod, Tula, Vladivostok, you know, many places, Smolensk. Go see them! Don't stay in Moscow looking at the Kremlin. There's so many things to do. So that is one of the greatest challenges to uh, de decentralization of Russia. Regionalizations, various um, not only ethnicities but social groups like the Cossacks. It was not foreordained they, they would be coerced into just one organization. So there are a number of organizations, Cossack organizations, but uh, there is a dominant one and that's the one blessed by the Kremlin. You see, we should pray, I mean it, for peace inside and outside of, um, of, of Russia because the longer there is peace, the more normal people in Russia have to reassert themselves educate themselves and emerge in some form. As I said, not pussy, right? <clears throat> yes, yes, sir. Your chronology, of historical chronology, did not mention Gorbachev. Does he fit into this? Well, uh, yes, he created the framework which enabled the Sukhiv Zakoni to emerge as business many after it had to, to ride high in the 1990s, the legal framework. Uh, he himself, there are those in the United States and in the West who think that he should be thanked because his humanitarianism uh, freed the Soviet people. The truth is, Gorbachev was primarily a sorcerer's apprentice who unleashed a, a genie out of a bottle and didn't know how to put it back in. That's number one. Number two, Gorbachev uniquely had no guts to mass murder. Even though we have documents that show that Gorbachev basically rejoiced and approved the Tiananmen Square massacre, when some in the KGB approached him and said, well, we have to kill about a million, maybe three million people. He didn't want to do it. It's not that he was averse to violence. One of the first victims of his Machiavellian game in the Soviet Union were Armenians in Baku. He countenanced an, an engineered pogrom against the Armenians. You know, stir things up in Baku at the very beginning. Uh, he was fishing in murky waters. In Tbilisi, he blessed the internal security troops to attack a crowd, don't shoot him, hit him with shovels, so entrenchment tools sharpened. And people died, but he had no Stalin's stomach or Lenin's stomach to mass murder. So he gets credit for that. His objective, however, was to save communism 
to save the Soviet Union. It was not to liberate anybody. But the genie got out of the bottle and that was it. That's where he fits in. So in a way, he will, uh, he's viewed by the current rulers of Russia either as a criminal who destroyed uh, the Soviet Union, which according to Putin was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe in the 20th century, or he's a friar, a sucker, who didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What is your opinion? Uh, did you study a lot um, the phenomenon of Navalny? Yeah. Because um, yes, he's he, a civilized nationalist. He used to be. He, uh, he releases a lot of information for the public to educate the public, but the public, none of them support him, and they don't believe him. Some of them, and they don't support him. So how can you explain all of that? Nobody is a prophet in his own country. When Navalny, a eh, played for the domestic public, he was much more nationalistic. Is that his real, uh, uh, is that his real face? I don't know, I'm not in his heart. With Nikita Petrov, I can tell you, he's a Zapadny, he's a Westerner, Westernizer, he's a nice guy. But with Navalny, I don't know him. I, I observe, obviously, I have observed him for some time now. He was much more nationalistic when he was not big time. And now he's much more palatable to the West because uh, many in the Russian opposition who want to go mainstream streamline their narrative to be acceptable by the New York TAS and the Washington Compost. And that's how they get kudos. If you want to exist, that's how you must sound in the West. So. That's my take on Navalny. Uh, whether or not the people will vote for him is another story. Uh, they enjoy his videos. But what, what I guess my question is that I'm trying to understand that he releases a lot of videos and information, and but no, nobody else releases as much. I understand but, but what people, you're saying. But people don't even like his information. I, can't, I, I don't quite understand that. Well, I can't tell you whether he is or is not a Malinowski. Do you know who Malinowski was? Malinowski was a Bolshevik Politburo member before the revolution and also a Duma deputy. I think he also had a thick criminal file involving rape, possibly pedophilia. So he was recruited by the Ukraina and he snitched on the Bolsheviks. And he had a lot of information. He also released a lot of information. I cannot speculate on Navalny or any of this, I am so used to active measures that one cannot exclude anything. At the same time, I keep myself afloat in a good mood because otherwise I'd be paranoid. And if I'm paranoid, I wouldn't be able to study any of this stuff. So that's my answer. I, I don't have a clearance. I'm the only nobody in this building. Everybody is somebody, not me. I just have a brain <laughs> without a clearance. <laughs> yes, sir. I feel like there might be an 800 pound gorilla in the room, but do you have any thoughts on the relationship between President Trump and Putin, the relationship between the supposed nation? Hey. Well, Trump is a showman and he's a businessman. He definitely tried to capitalize on the opening by Gorbachev. That deal didn't work out. While everyone has been looking, looking at Moscow and places like this, I'd say go to Baku. Check out the Trump Tower there. They, there may be there, there because I don't know how you do business. Only Mr. Klagatian knows how to do business in Azerbaijan. You, know, you have to be an Armenian. <laughs> so uh, again, this would be a speculation. Someone asked me one time about something in Kazakhstan. And I explained how this would have to be done. And then someone said, this is on the business side, but we have the Foreign Corruption Act. I said, well, we are at a distinct disadvantage. And then a few years later, the Swedes were arrested. Ericsson. A huge bribe scandal. 
<laughs> but they thought they didn't have a Foreign Corruption Act. It's extremely hard to operate. So by American standards, if you touch anything there, Tammany Hall would be a bunch of choir boys and Vestal virgins in comparison. But as I said, you need the Krisha to operate. The roof. Whether you're British Petroleum or the dude from Sacramento, California. Howdy, yes. Well, I was, I was curious. Um, actually, uh, uh, Putin uh, keeps quite close contact with Kissinger, and vice versa. And Kissinger is even extremely close to Lavrov. And Kissinger Associates uh, helps with a lot of uh, business businesses that want to do business in Russia. So, given your picture of business in Russia and the criminality, how do you fit in this massive uh, role of Henry Kissinger? Uh, Dr. Kissinger is ubiquitous and likes to make himself much needed and it isn't just Russia it's also other places someone one time made a joke to me and it didn't concern Russia oh Henry we have him on his retainer so when something happens here he writes an objective editorial in the New York Times that's how I fit him in. He is a player, he's been around, he's been able to monetize his indubitable greatness. So why not Russia? Why not Russia? And if the perception is that you are indispensable, then indeed everybody, or most everybody, thinks you are even if you're not. Okay, one more question and we have to vacate the premises for our eager students. So what do you think the ideal approach for America would be? Uh, to reduce the federal government by 90%, except the military, and send the 10% to study at the Institute of World Politics. <laughs> to, well, I'm serious. Uh, uh, people poke fun of the British Empire. Oh, you know, they were single-minded. Yes, they were incestuous. They were from Oxford and Cambridge. Classical edu education, Latin, Greek, and then you can unleash the sword of imagination. Athletics, of course. The British Empire was made on the fields of Eton. Yes. So, my advice is um, uh, to generate young elites, American elites, that would pay no attention to political correctness, uh, that, that would be interested in self-perfection, and they would like to serve a cause that's greater than themselves. And we can go from there. The Institute does not teach one what to think. We teach how to think. So you take any, program, any problem and we can have a zillion ideas about it. But without openness, without freedom, which is not obtainable in academia, as you know, anymore. Out there in the world, it's only possible here. You can do crazy stuff in my seminars. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think I get mad at the kids? Absolutely not. So that's, I have a short, I have a, a long-term vision. Otherwise my sister's uh, criticism kicks in about my being Cassandra. <laughs> and my end would be ugly. Yes. Okay. Sorry, real quick, were you referring to Roman Malinowski? Yes, Roman Malinowski, yes. He was Polish. Yeah. Or Polish origin, well, whatever. I thought maybe you were talking about the general. No, no, Marshall Malinowski, no, no, no. No, 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 I was talking about the beginning of the 20th century. Roman Malinowski, a, a snitch of the Ochrana, a great friend of Lenin.
Lenin was shocked when he saw his file. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Please, please remember about both.